Glad everyone's enjoying seeing each other. It's good. We have made it to Exodus chapter 5 in our study through the second book of, of the Bible. And obviously the Lord has um, a common theme for us. Very interesting uh, considering what we looked at this morning and in Matthew chapter 4, now here in Exodus chapter 5. Again, further driving home. Again, obviously the Lord wants us, afresh and new, to recognize the schemes of our enemy. It's obviously something that he has us here in the morning and the evening looking at this. And so, again, that, that gets my attention, that for some reason the Lord has us here um, to teach us on this and to remind us of these things. And so let's pray, and we will jump in and see what the Lord has for us. Father, again, we do ask that you would just anoint this time. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it never returns void. And we pray, God, as it goes out this evening, that you would do in us what needs to be done, Father. Um, some of us are going through difficult times. As we sang, we're not seeing you. We're not feeling you. In fact, things are growing more difficult the closer that we are seeking to, to walk with you. And so, Father, we need your word tonight to our hearts. And so use, Lord, the experience of the Israelites to speak to us. Um, as we walk out our days. And we pray that you do this by your Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we left at the end of chapter 4, Moses and Aaron in Egypt. They've now arrived. They've just spoken the words to the elders of the children of Israel that the Lord gave them. Moses showed them the signs, confirming that he had sent them. And as a result, we read, they believed. They bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord. They were in submission to all the Lord had said. They believed, they acknowledged God's going to do this. They believed him for the deliverance that he promised to bring to them. And so now, after speaking to the elders of the children of Israel, it's time for Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh to seek his cooperation in this deliverance. But as they quickly find out, Pharaoh was not in a very cooperative mood. And as we took note of last time, God had warned Moses and Aaron this would happen. He warned them this would be the case, that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. And so now we're seeing the beginnings of that played out here in chapter 5. There would be difficulty before deliverance. And what a picture this is for us in the physical realm between Pharaoh and the nation of Israel with how things operate in the spiritual realm. The great work that God desires to, to do in each of our lives is often preceded with greater oppression and greater affl affliction, just as it would be for Israel. And the reason for this is just like Israel, there is a cruel taskmaster who is not one bit interested in you and I walking in all that the Lord has for us. Just as Pharaoh was going to stand in, in the way and not just kick back and rejoice, concerning what God wanted to do among his people, so too we have a cruel taskmaster. So too the enemy of our souls. So too Satan will not stand by and celebrate the transformation that God wants to bring in your and my life. And having this picture here in Exodus chapter 5, along with that, again, that picture, that, that scenario we had in Matthew chapter 4 is so valuable for us. These this insight, this opportunity to see how the enemy operates in Jesus' life and here in the Israelites' life is so valuable for us because it keeps you and I from being pulled off track. We aren't unaware of his schemes. And remember, Paul speaks of the importance of this. He wrote in 2 Corinthians that we would not be ignorant of Satan's devices lest he take advantage of us. Now, recognizing his devices, seeing how he works, knowing his tactics, that doesn't make what we go through any less difficult. But what it does is it keeps us from being pulled off course. It keeps us from being deceived. It keeps us from falling to the trap and therefore failing to walk in the fullness of all that the Lord has called us to. So let's jump in and let's see what lessons, again, we can learn from Israel's experience. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 5 reads, afterward, again, after speaking to the Elders of the children of Israel, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. 
It's very easy to pick on Moses. And we've done that. We've picked on Moses, his excuses, his doubts, his disobedience. It's easy to point out his, his failures. So to be fair, I think we need to acknowledge that which is worthy of honor in Moses. And his action here is just that. It would have taken great courage to go before such a man as Pharaoh, to, to just go into his presence. And of all people, Moses would have understood just how great a task this was because Moses understood who Pharaoh represented because Moses had grown up in the home of a Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't just a man of of great power and authority, but those who served in this position, they were considered to be children of the sun, S-U-N. That is, they were considered gods. That Pharaoh, a person in that position, wasn't just acting in the authority of man. They were considered to be acting in the authority of deity. Moses knows that. He grew up in this home. He saw that. He saw people come into the presence of Pharaoh. He saw how people revered Pharaoh. He saw the authority, the power that was vested in him. And yet here goes Moses into the presence of this one and boldly declares the word of the Lord. This would have taken great faith on Moses' part. And as he goes in, of course, he declares that famous line, right? Let my people go. But in that statement, it says so much about God and about his character and about his, his heart. And what it lets us know is that those who belong to God, notice he says, my people, those who belong to God should be a free people. That God says his people Those who belong to him are to walk in freedom. It's Satan, again, typified by Pharaoh that wants us living in bondage. And that bondage can have a lot of different flavors, can it? It can be bondage to drugs or alcohol or sexual bondage or uh, gambling. You know, a lot of times when we think about somebody's in bondage, we usually think of those big four. Well, they've got a problem with one one of those four things. But the reality is, Bondage can be just as crippling when it's bondage to worry or bondage to anxiety or bondage to to depression or or fear or perfectionism. Those things can cripple us just as greatly as anything else. And what God is revealing here through Moses is that the Lord doesn't want us to be bound by these things. His kids aren't to be controlled like that. He wants us free. Free. But notice, in this call for freedom, Moses makes something, I think, clear that we don't always think about. Moses makes clear that that true freedom is not just found in being released from something. But he makes clear that the fullness of freedom means being released, yes, but then being attached to something else. The call is, let my people go, and there's no period there. That. Here's the reason. They may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. God, God, through Moses, is showing us God sets us free again from that which is destructive, that which will destroy in order that we might be then attached to that which gives life. That, of course, being God himself. They were to be set free from Egypt so they could go and worship, be submitted to the Lord, have an encounter, have fellowship with the Lord. This shows us biblical freedom is not simply the absence of being under authority. Now, political freedom, national freedom may mean that. But biblical freedom is not simply the absence of being under authority. Biblical freedom means living under the right authority. The Lord sets us free from sin. The Lord sets us free from the flesh that brings death so that we can now live under a new authority which brings life and peace. And so this call for freedom from Egypt was so again they might go out and honor and worship and have relationship, be in submission to the true God. As Jesus declared, no man can serve two masters. Now, just a quick question, a quick, I think, thought that rises from this call that God has Moses give to to Pharaoh, and and that is, is is Moses kind of twisting the truth here? I mean, is Moses, is he lying? God God said he was going to deliver them for good from Egypt. 
And Moses says, can, can, can they just go out and hold a feast? Or can, they, can they just kind of go out and, and have a worship service to their God? Like, well, what's Moses doing here? And even in verse 3, he's going to say, can, can we just take a three-day journey? That's all. We, we just need a three-day journey to be able to go out and, and offer sacrifices to, to our God. Is Moses being manipulative? Is he, he kind of, you know, I'll get him to agree to this, and then we're going to run real fast once we get out of town? I don't believe any of that. One explanation may be that the Lord was using this to reveal Pharaoh's heart. Because to just start out with, Pharaoh, I want you to let all these people go forever for good. That could possibly be seen as an, an unreasonable request. You can't just ask me to do that. But this call, just let us go out for a few days and hold a feast, that would be very reasonable. Very reasonable. We need, we need time to get out of the land of Egypt, get out of the Egyptian gods to worship our God. Very reasonable. The fact that Pharaoh says no to this request, it really reveals the true state of his heart. And it also shows that the judgment he's going to receive is totally justifiable. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even relent. He wouldn't even let them take a few days to go and worship their God. Well, here's his response again right away. Verse 2 says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now, this question Pharaoh asked, Who's the Lord? I imagine by the time Israel left Egypt, he wished he hadn't asked that question. He's going to find out very clearly who the Lord is, who Yahweh is. But here now in his pride, his arrogance, again, as the one who considered himself a God, he has no respect for this Yahweh, this God of Israel. He probably thinks, well, if, if he's their God, he must not be much of a God. If his people are in bondage and slavery, I mean, what kind of God is that? He probably thought, he's no threat to me. I don't know of him, never heard of him, must not be much of a God. Who does he think he is? And again, Pharaoh will soon find out exactly who he is. Verse 3, so they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And so they appeal again to Pharaoh. And notice the respect they show. They ask, please let us go. There's no demanding there, there's, this, there's this call, there's this respect. And they put all the emphasis on them. Right? Please let us do this so we don't fall under judgment. So, so our God's not angry at us. Notice the focus not, is not on what's going to happen to Pharaoh. If you don't do this, Pharaoh, you better watch out. There's none of that to start with. Now, that will be made clear to come as Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. It'll be made clear the judgment he's incurring on himself by, by saying no. But in the beginning, it's this gracious appeal. And I think it's such a picture to us of how God always comes to us and appeals to us in grace before judgment. Now, judgment is a part of the gospel. We know that. God doesn't hide that. We, we, we don't pretend. That's why we, if we don't understand what judgment, we don't understand why we need salvation. But again, Paul makes clear it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. He comes in his grace first, his love, his mercy. It's also interesting to note that Moses speaks here of the need of sacrifice in order to avoid judgment. And it just kind of jumps out to me that we see here the reality of sacrifice wasn't something that was created when the law was given. And God's going to give Moses the law. He's going to give it to the people. And a lot of times we think, well, that's when sacrifice was, was instituted, when it really wasn't. Yes, God very, he solidifies it. He gives the specifics of it, of what it's to look like. He codifies it. But it was way before the law was given. Remember Adam and, Adam and Eve. They sinned. They eat of the fruit. They realize the, the shame, their nakedness. And what does God do? He clothes them, which means he had to sacrifice. He had to kill an animal. Those animals died so that Adam and Eve could be covered. And so here, again, is the recognition of sacrifice even before the law was given. And what a picture this is. From the very beginning of, of, of the scripture all the way through, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus as the sacrifice for the death, for the, for the punishment we deserve. 
was pointed to, again, not just from the law, but from way before. It's always been about the sacrifice. So people say, well, it was all about following rules and regulations in the Old Testament. And then when Jesus came, now it was about, you know, trusting in him. No, it was never about rules and regulations to be made right with God. From the very beginning, it was about one who would die in the place of a sinner. One whose life would be given in place of the one who had rebelled against the Lord. And again, we see that, that here, even that understanding, Moses having that understanding for how God's wrath would be abated, even in this day. The innocent had to die for the guilty. It's also interesting in this that it was a three-day journey that Moses says was needed for the sacrifice in order to be effective to deliver them from this judgment of God. We need to go out three days. And again, how prophetic, because it would be three days following the sacrifice of Jesus in which it was proven that the atonement for our sin was adequate as the Father would raise Jesus from the dead on the third day, proving that that sacrifice was sufficient. It was enough to cover our sin, deliver us from the judgment we deserve. Well, as you can imagine, once again, this second appeal, though it was very gracious, it didn't work. Verse four, then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. Pharaoh basically accuses Moses and Aaron of being rabble rousers. They said, why are you guys here stirring up the pot? Who's paying you? You know, are you working for the union? Well, what's going on here? Why are you putting these crazy ideas in their heads? You're distracting the people from their jobs. We have a lot of good workers right now. You know, employment's high and you're interrupting production. It's kind of the idea of you have people thinking about this three day vacation when there's work to be done. Now, some of you are thinking, I've had a boss like that. Um, you haven't had one like Pharaoh, okay? It's gonna get a lot worse because Pharaoh didn't just stop with no. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have time for a vacation right now. Get back to work. No, he's gonna take a work that's already hard, it's already difficult, it's already full of affliction, and he's gonna take it to a whole new level of oppression. Verse six, so the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Verse 9, Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. So not only did Pharaoh not relent in the face of God's desire for deliverance, he cranked up the thermostat. He took things to a whole new level. He, he made things so much harder. No more would the materials be supplied to carry out the work. No more would, would straw be provided. Now they would have to find their own materials. Now they would have to find their own straw. And of course, the straw would have helped make the clay bind together easier. Made it, made it stronger. So the bricks wouldn't be brittle. It wouldn't be breaking on them. They would hold together better in the, in the mold. Provide stability and strength. And now this very important ingredient wouldn't be there for them to go and get. Now they had to go find it themselves. And on top of that, they would have to produce the same quota. They would have to provide the same number they've always provided. And Pharaoh's like, okay, they have, they have time to go on a three-day vacation in the wilderness? Then obviously they have too much time on their hands. Obviously I haven't given them enough to do. And we have to recognize these people were already maxed out. It wasn't like they were kind of just goofing off and lazily going about their day and working a couple of hours and taking a couple hour lunch break. It would be like having a job where you already work, you know, 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. You know, you're just getting home, you get some food down, you say, you know, hi to the kids and you go to bed and you get up and do it all over again every day of the week. And then your boss coming to you and saying, hey, you know what? Um, no more 12 hour days you know, seven days a week. Now we're going to 15 hour days, seven days a week. I mean, you can just imagine the, the emotional burden, not just physically, 
I mean, this manual hard labor, but just emotionally, what this would have meant to, to the Israelites when they heard this. Now, forget vacation. You put more work on them and tell them not to regard false words. It's interesting how Pharaoh refers to what the Lord has spoken there at the end of verse 9 as, as false words. The idea that you're going to get a reprieve, the idea that you can go and enjoy a feast with your God and fellowship with your God and be close to him and know him, that is false. Pharaoh says, you tell him that, that's fake news. Here's your reality. I'm taking more from you. That's what's going to happen. And is this not a picture of how Satan responds when he sees us pressing into the Lord? When he sees us begin to believe God's word and trust his promises, he digs in. He begins to, to put pressure in our, in our lives like we've never seen. And he mocks God's word in the process. You think God's going to do this for you? You think God's going to set you free and give you this and you're going to be able to rest and actually, you know, not be consumed with, with anxiety and worry? And don't, 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 don't listen to those false words. No, things are going to get harder for you. Things are going to be more oppressive for you. He mocks God. And of course, we call this spiritual warfare. We saw Jesus engage in it this morning. And it's real. Just as real and just as difficult as what these Israelites had to deal with from Pharaoh is what you and I have to deal with in the spiritual realm. It's just real. It may look differently. It may not cause us to have to work as hard or, or sweat or strain, but emotionally, spiritually, it's just as heavy. It's just as intense. And if you don't think spiritual warfare is real, then seek to be more intentional in your walk with the Lord. And you'll find out very quickly how real it is. Right? We, we don't have an enemy who hears and sees our desire to, to be more submissive to the Lord, to get closer to him and say, oh, oh, you want to fellowship more with your God? You want to get closer to him? Well, that's wonderful. Right? Let, me, let me bake a cake for you, for your journey, so you have something to eat on the way. You know, obviously, we're being silly, but we know that's not our enemy. That's not how he operates. He fights hard. He fights hard when an unbeliever is moving closer to salvation. And those and those goads of, of the Holy Spirit are digging deeper and pulling them. And he also fights hard when a believer seeks to give greater lordship to Jesus in their life. Even though Satan knows he's going to lose, he fights to the end. It's what we see in the book of Revelation we just studied. Knowing he's going to lose, he fights hard all the way to the end. We see it in the Gospels in Jesus' first coming. Remember the, the boy in Luke 9 who came to Jesus' disciples, or excuse me, the father who came to Jesus' disciples, his son um, was possessed and disciples, they couldn't cast it out, so he brings it to Jesus. And, and Luke tells us that as the boy was coming, coming to Jesus, the demon, who we know in Scripture, the demons always recognize Jesus. They knew who he was when nobody else did. They knew his authority. They knew he's the Son of God. It says that demon still threw that boy down and convulsed him right in front of Jesus. He wasn't going to let go until the very end. That's our enemy. And so we shouldn't be surprised when, when we see the Lord at work in our lives or we see the, the Lord at work in, in someone's life that we love to, to also see the enemy trying to make things very, very difficult as well. It's what he was doing here in the, in the lives of these Israelites. And verse 10 says, And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out, spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourself straw where you can find it. Yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. So notice it wasn't just they had to find straw, but we're told now there wasn't really any straw to find. What they had to find was the stubble. What they had to find was what was left over in the fields after it had been cut and harvested and baled. They had to scrounge around for the leftovers, what fell out, what didn't get picked up. Again, that's how harsh, that's how cruel a taskmaster Pharaoh was, and that's how harsh and cruel a taskmaster Satan is. 
And just kind of a, a side note, kind of an interesting note, archaeology has actually shown the accuracy of what we're reading here in terms of this, this building that they have found in the, the city of Epitham, one of the, the cities we read earlier that, that Pharaoh had the Israelites building in. They found layers of bricks, and the bottom layer had straw in it. The next layer had stubble and grass in it, and the next layer was just clay. It had nothing. Again, a testing to this very command, this very thing that we're reading here in Exodus chapter 5. Verse 13. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work. Your daily quota is when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today, as before? So again, they put in these incredible situations, these mind-blowing circumstances, and then the pressure is just all around them, making sure, keeping up your quota, making sure they're still pr producing like they always had, and when they weren't producing, when they failed to meet, meet the quota, they were beaten. They were, they were disciplined. Just amazing, harsh situation. And I think it's important to keep this in mind, to keep Exodus chapter 5 in mind when we get later on in Exodus. And the children of Israel, they've been delivered. They've, they've passed through the Red Sea. They've seen God split it. They walked through, drowned the Egyptian army. And they're there with the Lord. And they start complaining. They start griping. Right? Somebody went to the grocery store, and they didn't get what I had on the grocery list. Right? They didn't, we're not having the food I want to eat out here in the wilderness, God. And because God wasn't meeting their every little whim and desire, remember they start complaining, looking back, oh, if we'd never left Egypt. Oh, if we had just, just stayed there. God brought us out here to die. And as you read Exodus chapter 5, it just strikes you of how amazing it is that we can have such short memories as humans, isn't it? To see what they went through, to, to see where they found themselves before God set them free. It's a reminder for us, our worst day with the Lord is better than our best day in the world. And yes, God allows hard things in our life. Following the Lord brings difficult things, but it's always filtered through his love and his mercy. Sadly, they'll quickly forget what they went through, where they found themselves. And it's sad that, again, we can even do that. And we can find ourselves as believers saying, oh, the good, the good days back in the world. Oh, remember what things were like. And we forget the, the Exodus 5 experiences. Verse 15, then the officers of the children of Israel came after getting this word, and they cried out to Pharaoh saying, why are you dealing thus with your servants? There's no straw given to your servants, and they say to us, make brick. And indeed, your servants are beaten but the fault is in your own people. Now, now, the Israelites do what seems to make natural sense, right? They take their issue to Pharaoh. Right? He's in charge. Right? He's, the, he's the CEO. And so they go all the way up to, to the top with their complaint. Right? He gave the order. You're treating us like this. The fault's with you. You're giving us demands that we have no ability to meet. You're acquiring things out of us and not giving us the resources. But now what's sad in this is though it makes sense for them to go all the way to Pharaoh um, with their issue, what, what we don't see is them crying out to the Lord. Well, they're crying strongly to Pharaoh, but we don't see them crying to the one who's truly in charge of the situation. And yet, isn't that how we so often are? We have an issue with our boss. We have an issue with a family member. We have an issue with the government, right? And our initial response is run to the person involved. I'm going straight to the top. I'm dealing with that person or I'm going to somebody connected with them who can get to them to, to get help. And we fail to realize that ultimately every issue that we walk through, whether it's relational, whether it's on the job, whether it's governmental, every issue is a spiritual issue. Which means, if every issue is a spiritual issue, then the first one that we need to cry out to is the Lord. It's not that the boss, not that the family member, it's not that the authority in our life doesn't need to be addressed, but as a believer, it should only be after we first 
have taken it to the Lord. And yet, it's so easy to forget this. And I think we all, we all know this, right? We have that issue, right? It happens and it's not right and it's unfair and our emotion gets going and we, we, we just rush. I'm going to deal with that right now. I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to go to that person. I'm going to straighten this out. And we get in the middle of it or we rush in our emotion and then we kind of mess things up and then it hits us at some point, right? You know what? I never even prayed about that. I got so caught up in dealing with it and take care of it. I never stopped to pray. And I think we can all relate to those experiences. And it just reminds me that how the Lord needs to grow us to the place where he's the first one we crowd to before we go to, to anyone else. They immediately, they run to Pharaoh. But again, it doesn't change his heart. Verse 17, but he said, you are idle. You're idle. Because you guys are lazy. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work. For no straw shall be given to you, yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble. After it was said, you shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. Very interesting phrase there at the end of verse 19 when it says, and the officers of the children of Israel saw they were in trouble. It's like at this point, they, they heard it from, the, from, the, from their managers. They heard it from their taskmasters. But now when they hear it from the lips of Pharaoh, they realize, you know what? They're not just blowing smoke. This wasn't just a motivational technique. They mean this. They are actually going to hold us accountable to this, to keeping our production, even though they're not giving us the resources to do it. And it's like the weight just hits them in that moment. Like, we're in big trouble. This is going to destroy us. Moses had just told them from the Lord, deliverance is coming. You're going to be set free. God's about to do a, an incredible work. He's heard your cry. He's heard your prayer. He's, he's seen your afflictions. He's going he's to deliver you from this. And the next thing they see is that they're in trouble. What they see doesn't match what they just heard. And whenever we find ourselves in, in that place, we find ourselves at a crossroads. That's a crisis of faith moment. That's a moment we can go one of, of two ways. When what we see doesn't match what we just heard, what we just read in our quiet time, or what we heard on a Sunday morning. We heard that teaching. We knew that promise, that truth was just for us concerning our situation. And then we, then we leave. We get up out of our quiet time, and we walk in the office. We walk back in the family. And what we see doesn't match what God just said at all. There's a crossroads there. Because that, that's when... That's when doubt starts to creep in. That's when, that's when panic begins to happen. That's when, when, when bitterness is just ready to enter. Anger is ready to, to fill our hearts. That moment, how are we going to respond? Well, the children of Israel are at that crossroads, and we see that, that sadly they go the wrong direction. And we see this in their response to Moses and Aaron, which was really a response to the Lord because Moses and Aaron were their representatives. Notice verse 20. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. I think it's interesting. Moses and Aaron, they didn't run away. They didn't run and hide. I'm afraid what Pharaoh may say. No, they were there at the door, right outside the, 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 the office, ready to hear what Pharaoh had said to these officers. Good leaders standing with them. But as we see, they're going to end up taking the brunt of these officers' frustration. And they said to them, we need to gather to pray. No. And then they said to them, now remind us, Moses, what did God say to us? We need to hear it again. We need to hear what God said to us. No. They said, let the Lord look on you and judge. Basically, may God do you guys in. May he strike you. Lightning right now. Because you've made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. This response to Moses and Aaron, it looks a lot different, doesn't it? From what we read back in, again, verse 31 of chapter 4. When at the words of, of Moses and Aaron that God had heard them, he was going to deliver them. It says the people believed. 
When they heard the Lord had visited the children of Israel, he looked on their afflictions, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. And hearing of God's plan, deliverance, they're worshiping. They're excited, God's so good, he's so merciful, he's so kind, he's so wonderful. But now that plan starts to get worked out, they have a totally different attitude. And sadly, I can relate. You hear God's promises, you receive his word, and you're like, God, you're so amazing. God, this, this is incredible what you're going to do, what, what you've said. But when the fulfillment of that word doesn't begin to go in the way we expect, or we imagine, or we play it out in our heads as it should go, then we start feeling hurt. Then we feel justified in our anger. Then we feel justified to act in the flesh, take matters into our own hands. Our thinking gets all out of line. And, and notice how out of line their thinking is. Here they are saying, you made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh. No, <laughs> you've always been abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh. From the very beginning, he has cared nothing about you. He's hated you. It's interesting how Satan likes to make people think that he's their friend. Satan loves to make make people think that, that he's on, on, on their side. He's for them. I've got all these good things for you. And it reminds me of the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, right? The, the, the White Witch and the Turkish Delight, right? She gets Edmund with that, with that Turkish Delight, and he's just eating it up and loving it until she gets the information out of him that she wanted because she was using him all the time. And then he finds himself in chains. Then he finds himself with a, with a crusty moldy ball of bread to eat. That's how the enemy works. He loves to, to deceive us all the while he's using us. And the Lord begins to move in our hearts and open our eyes to the truth. And we see the Lord offers us something so much better. And at that moment, Satan will take the gloves off. Right? And the one who masquerades as an angel of light, he takes the, the mask off. And in that moment, we, we see the ugliness of him pulling out all the stops to keep a person from submitting to the Lord's work. And a person can think, wow, not necessarily Satan, but they may think, wow, the world, I thought, I thought the world was my friend. I thought, I thought the world was offering me so, so much. And now they've become ugly and cruel. But the reality is they were that way all the time. They've been that way from the beginning. We're just seeing clearly now. And really that's what the children of Israel were seeing clearly now. And I believe one of the reasons that we, like these officers of Israel, react, react like we do when, when things get harder in our life is that we so often operate with this faulty thinking that says, if God's working in my life, he'll never allow things to get worse in my life. And whether we've ever been taught that or not, I don't know if we're really taught that, but somehow I think we get that in our, in our minds. Well, if God's at work in my life, if he's moving in my life, He'll never allow things to get worse. Oh, Satan may, may try to do some things, but God would never allow him to, to go through with that and proceed with that. But biblically, we see that's, that's just not true. God's work in our life will often look worse in the beginning. Remember Jesus and the disciples, right? They, they had endured for three years incredible mockery and harassment and name calling and persecution. And Jesus finally says, okay, guys, we're going to Jerusalem. My time has finally come. Obviously, God's definitely at work. It would have been very easy to think, if you're a disciple, oh, things are going to get better now. We're going there. Finally, what Jesus came to do, things are going to get better. But as we know, it wasn't the case. What happened? Things got even worse. Their rabbi, their master would be arrested. They would be scattered. Jesus would end up being crucified. And only after things got worse did deliverance come. It's, spiritually speaking, it's often the darkest before the dawn. And yes, it's the enemy that's at work. God is never the author of evil. But we can't forget that God is sovereign, even over evil, even over the enemy. He was sovereign even over Pharaoh. And God in his sovereignty does at times allow things to get worse before they get better. He allows it, as we talked about this morning, Jesus and his temptation to test us, to grow us, to, to stretch our faith, to show us what's in our hearts, to teach us to battle, to, to, to give us, learn how to be strong in spirit. At this point, there are obviously some heart issues that need to be dealt with in the Israelites and still some that need to be dealt with in, in Moses. But if we'll understand this truth, 
if we understand that, that this is something normal that happens in our life, then when it does happen, it doesn't mean necessarily it's easier to go through, but what we're able to do now is we're able to meet it in faith rather than in fear or anger or, or doubt. Well, notice this doesn't just affect the officers of Israel, but it spills over into Moses as well. Verse 22 says, so Moses returned to the Lord and he said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Now, before we point out some negative in, in Moses, again, I think we need to point out what was right. In contrast with the officers of Israel, Moses did take his problem to the Lord. Moses didn't say, well, let me go in and talk to Pharaoh right now. You don't know. He says he returned to the Lord. His first thought was, I'm crying out to my God. And so he runs to the Lord. He seeks answers from the Lord. He makes prayer his first option. And, and he's honest with the Lord. I mean, he, he pours out his heart. There's honesty there. But at the same time, in this prayer, Moses does, again, what we often do. And that is he falls right back into the flesh. And he fails to remember what God spoke to him. He fails to hold on to God's word. He brings up the same issue he brought up before, right? That sounds very familiar. He asked there at the end of verse 22, why is it you've sent me? We've heard this before. He reverts back to the whole, I'm unqualified for this. I don't have the mouth for this. Send someone else, God. And yet the Lord had addressed it. And Moses seemingly had moved on. He stepped out in faith. But now he's right back there dealing with the same doubt now that things don't go his way. And again, I have to think of my own life. How God will deal with an area of my flesh. That I go through something and it comes out and it's ugly and it's yucky. And it makes a mess of things. And you, know, and you repent of it. And um, you know, God shows you mercy. And you feel like, okay, I'm stronger now. God's exposed it in my heart. You know, I'm going to deal with it now. We're, we're good. And then lo and behold, some other situation happens. And that same flesh and that same reaction comes out again. And it's so discouraging. I'm glad you guys don't have to deal with that, but I do. But the good news is just as God was patient with Moses, again, he's patient with us. And on top of that, Moses seems to have forgotten what God said about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. I mean, God had said, he's not going to let the people go, at least not initially. God was very clear in this. And yet here's Moses right, saying, the only thing that's happened since I've gotten here is that Pharaoh won't listen to us. He's only done evil and you haven't delivered the people yet. You just imagine God going, yeah, that's exactly what I said was going to happen. And again, it's not the first time we've seen, we've seen this in Moses. Remember, he struggled early on, early on truly hearing, holding on what God said. Right? He, see, he comes to God, well, God, what if, what if the people don't listen to me? What if they don't believe you sent me? What if they don't heed my voice? He uses those words when, and just a few verses earlier, God had very clearly said, Moses, they will heed your voice. And here he is again. Right? God had clearly said, Pharaoh's heart's going to be hardened. He's not going to listen. Oh, God, why, why, is, why is Pharaoh's heart being evil? Why haven't you done anything yet? Again, we see ourselves, don't we? It's a reminder for us. God has given his word to us to be the foundation of our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, by the word of God. If we'll just hold on to that word, if we'll just stand on it. I think of, of Jesus and his disciples on the road to Emmaus and what he said to those, those two disciples that I'm sure he says in heaven about me all the time. Not they meet Jesus, they don't know who he is, their eyes are, are, are covered and they're they're down in the dubs. We've lost all hope. We thought, we thought our Messiah was here. We thought the deliverer of Israel was here. But, but then, you know, three days ago, he was crucified and all our hopes were dashed. And you remember what Jesus said to these guys? He says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in to his glory? It's like, did you guys not listen in, you know, Sabbath school, Torah classes? It was very clear. In the Old Testament, this is what was going to happen. This was predicted. And because they didn't hold on to it, they were down. They were doubting, just like Moses, just like we do. But again, such patience of the Lord with those disciples, such patience with the Lord with Moses, and such patience with us. And we're going to read God's response to Moses in chapter 6, and it's not what we would expect where God says, okay, I've had enough. I'm done. I gave you a second chance. 
we're moving on to somebody else. No, God's going to speak to him again and encourage him again and remind him, I'm in charge. It's my will that's going to be done. Deliverance will happen. And Moses, no matter how difficult things get in the meantime, I'm going to use all this for my glory and for my people's good. And as we wrap up tonight, I think that's a truth that we need to hear just as much in our lives today as Moses and the Israelites need to, to hear it then. Just to be encouraged, don't let the difficulties you're, you're currently experiencing, don't let the increase in oppression in your life or, or the life of someone you love make you think God's not at work. To make you think, well, the enemy's just too strong here. I mean, this must mean he's going to win. It must mean God's not going to be able to handle this. It must mean it's not going to go through. That's what the enemy wants us to think because he wants us to quit. He knows he can't win, but what he can do is get us to quit. What he can do is get us just to move off to the sidelines. The fact is, it's very likely just the opposite. The increase in opposition is very likely proof God's on the move. He's getting close to doing a great work. As crazy as it sounds, the fact that the enemy is rearing his ugly head in our lives is a pretty good indication that we are on the right track, that God is up to something. And so let's not allow him to scare us or sow doubt in our hearts or cause us to throw in the towel. Let's trust. God's sovereign. He's in control. And he's using it all. Even the worst that Pharaoh had to offer, even the worst that the enemy of our souls has to offer, he's using it all for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are patient with us. And Father, we thank you that you're always there to encourage us. Um, Lord, I just pray that tonight we would receive your encouragement. Again, you know where we are as your kids tonight. You know the situations we find ourselves in. You, you know the Egypts. You know the the people in our life, you know the situations, you know the things the enemy is, is stirring, the difficulty and the trouble that he is causing. And Father, we thank you that even in the midst of that, you're sovereign, you're in control, and Father, you don't waste anything. And so God, I pray that tonight we would be encouraged not to throw in the towel, not to look at our situation and because it doesn't match what we heard you say to think, well, you must not be at work or it must be done or things are too far gone. Lord, no, I pray that we would stay in and continue to trust your word, continue to hold on to what you said to us instead of what we see, instead of what we feel, and to know, Lord, that just as it was with the children of Israel, the deliverance is going to maybe right around the corner, that you're going to honor your promise. You don't always do it in the way we think you should, Lord, but you will do it in the best way, the way that's for our good and the way that's ultimately for your glory. So again, just encourage us as your people tonight, Lord, as the sheep of your hand, that we would just rest in you and trust you and walk by faith, Lord. You know we're weak, uh, you know we're frail, and so we ask that, again, you fill us with your spirit. Show us mercy, show us grace. Don't give us what we deserve, Lord. Lord, your kindness is what we desire, your favor. And we thank you that it's possible to ask that and receive that through Jesus, the one who died in our place, the one who stood up to the greatest trial and testing ever. And because he was successful, Lord, in him, we can be successful and we can make it through. And so we praise you and we thank you for Jesus. We want to leave here worshiping you and thanking you, Lord, tonight for your goodness. And we pray and ask it all in his precious and holy name. Amen.